Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Today is uh, Wednesday, January 29th, 2020. This is a special meeting uh, for the fiscal year 21 budget kickoff. And most, if not all, the presentation will be by our finance director, Dina Darrow. The meeting is being uh, videotaped. It is being live streamed. So in the future, if you cannot attend or know of anybody that cannot attend, it will be available in a live stream, okay? And that's typically, is that YouTube, Nancy? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, and so do we have any changes to the agenda before we move any forward? Okay, hearing none, attending a commission is Duncan Brooks and Filios. I didn't announce the time. It is actually, well, we started 9.03 a.m. And before I go any further, I'd like to call on Clerk Jim Brannon. Jim, take it away, please. Thank you, Chairman Filios. And boy, we know how to pack a room. I like to see this. Seems like we just did this, but here we are again. One of the things that we do when we send our people to training is we try to come up with better ideas for more efficiencies and saving everyone's valuable time. What Dina is going to be presenting today came out of one of those trainings. So with that, I'll be quiet and turn it over to Dina. Thanks, Jim. Clerk Jim Brandon, everybody. Yeah. Round of applause. Still leading. So, wow, who knew a budget would be like a rock show? Look at all the people here, my gosh. So like Jim said, we're working on efficiencies. We want to save time. We want to save money. And we want everybody to get involved because the budget is the primary method that we communicate with our public. It's how we show how we're doing and what we're doing for them. So it's really key. So it's good to see everybody here participating in the process. And like last year, all of you will be in the loop as we go through the budget process, as decisions are being made, because we're all affected like this, we're all in it together. So this presentation should be fun if I can get the sound to work. We had some technical difficulties, but before I start there, I want to introduce our innovation team. It seems kind of early, we're getting started on the budget, but actually we've been working on the budget for the last month and we put together a key team of innovators to come up with ideas to test some new forms and to do some troubleshooting. So I want to introduce those team members to you today. From Solid Waste, Lorreen Chafin, stand up. <laughs> Tammy Exley from the Sheriff's Office. <laughs> Nancy Pluff from the BOCC, our illustrious business analyst. <laughs> Saving us even this morning, thank you Nancy. Michelle Chiramonte, while I do the talking, she does the rocking, our budget analyst. <laughs> Reba Greatness couldn't be here today because she's in Mexico. So kudos to Reba. She also had it, played a huge role. So thank you guys. These guys have been working really hard to make the budget easier for you. So all in all, we're trying to reduce the amount of forms. We're trying to reduce the amount of work that you have to do so that you can get back to doing what you do. So without further ado then, let's get into the budget season. Is everybody excited? Are we excited? <laughs> New budget season, right on. Okay. So we're going to see how this works. So I'm a big fan of the Banff Film Festival. I don't know if you guys have been to the Banff Film Festival, but it was last weekend, so I got really stoked. So this entire presentation goes into the theme of extreme sports, because budgets are an extreme sport. Technical difficulties.
stream video to get you all pumped up about the budget. But I know you're already pumped up about, about the budget because you're here, right? Okay. So today's, today our goals are to review some preliminary projections for the budget, for the board to identify its priorities for the budget, and determine our direction for launching the 2021 budget because we always have a starting place with the budget. So this is a big decision for the commissioners. This sets the table for the meal that we're going to consume. So we'll have a best case scenario, which if you picked up the handouts, you can see the best case and worst case scenario. We did have a little snafu with one of the formulas, so things aren't actually as bleak as they look. So yay, right? So we're going to identify priorities. When you look at that picture, no, there is no child in that carrier. That's a doll. But that is from the Banff Film Festival, and it was a very cool video. So we're going to dive into the starting points for personnel ads and changes, get uh, BOCC guidance for that, where we're going to start with the B budget, uh, what kinds of capital items are going to be on the table and off the table, and what level of benefits the board wants to fund by the county versus by employees, just as a starting point. Um, we're going to look at our fun sticky note panel. We've been working on this for a while, so this will help us uh, organize our thoughts and make decisions. So some of the items that we'll be talking about on the sticky note panels are, what are our revenue sources this year? Well, we're not sure. The state is working on maybe changing some of our revenue sources. So that's why we have the best case and worst case scenario to look at. Um, in the A budget, we still have some work to do with the wage study. So that's going to cost us some money. What kind of increases are we going to do? Are we going to entertain a COLA? I know that's been discussed before. Will there be merit? Um, what kinds of increases will be uh, attached to the matrices? And any bonus pool that we might have or any overtime changes that we're going to have? All of those things will be addressed today. Um, what we're thinking about doing, what we're going to recommend on doing is using the uh, consumer price index for the B budget to save you a whole bunch of time on B budget asks and um, just talk about capital and what our capital priorities are for the county for this year. So who's ready? Are we ready? Let's do this thing. My apologies. Uh, did you try HDMI too? Yeah. You did? Our yeah, IT director is coming to the rescue. Thank you, James. Thank you, James. He's putting on his big glasses. So maybe in the budget we should have some uh, upgrades to our video system, maybe, maybe. While Dean is trying to work things out, I'll mention a couple of items. These are, um, <clears throat> excuse me, house bills that are pending. Uh, and I'll mention just two of them, possibly three. Uh, these bills are pending. They were introduced in the House, that is to say our State House. Um, one or both have been returned to committee for further consideration, but I'll, I'll mention the bills and the, and the essence of them anyway. Uh, the one, first one in particular is a House bill. That means it's in the House. It hasn't reached the Senate yet. Uh, and it would have to pass the House in order to get to the Senate, as you might be aware. 
and that's House Bill 353. And this harkens back to what I, uh, Dina was alluding to earlier. It's a 3% property tax budget cap. It was introduced by a legislator. Are we ready? Almost. Okay, from Ada County. And it's the, uh, the committee is House uh, Revenue and Taxation. And I'll just briefly read the bill summary. Establishes a hard 3% cap on annual property tax budget increases, including new construction. Local taxing districts would have to choose between budgeting the traditional 3% up to 3% of new construction property taxes or a combination of the two. Foregone property taxes remain unchanged. Basically, the bottom line is we get 3%. How we get to the 3%, whether it's through the traditional method uh, and or new construction, we're capped at 3 You say, well, what does that mean? Okay, so if that were the case in this current fiscal year 20, we raised uh, 1.4 million with our th traditional 3% and 1.2 uh, with uh, new growth. So that gave us a total of 2.6. So technically, if this were in effect, we would have, we'd have been missing out on the 1.2. So we would only have raised 1.4 million. So that's just to give you a perspective. So that's the one bill that's pending. Uh, it's still in the House. I think it has been sent back to committee. And then the other one, and I'll make it brief, is uh, 355. First one was 353. This is 355. I'm skipping over 354. And 355 is a property tax freeze introduced by uh, another legislator from Ada County. Bear oh, this is the same one. I'm sorry. Uh, Moyle. Uh, yeah, that's right. It is Moyle. Same one. Sorry. Um, and that's in the House Revenue and Taxation Committee. And essentially, uh, it institutes a one-year freeze in local government property tax budget increases. No increases for fiscal 21. So if one or both of these should pass, um, I think it's going to be potentially rough going in the House, but it might pass the House. Then it'd have to pass the Senate. I think it might have a harder time in the Senate. but. Uh, we'll know presumably by the end of March or mid-April, and that will definitely have an effect on, on our decision making. And without further ado, take it away, Dina. Thank you, Commissioner Filios, for saving me and filling that time void. Um, as the commissioner mentioned, we're going to have a best case and a worst case scenario. Best case is business as usual. We're able to use our revenue sources. So what you're seeing up here, you also have a handout of, except for this wasn't added into this total, so actually we're in a little bit better shape starting off. So just to walk through these numbers, what we've done at the top, that 3% there, that's assuming that we're going to take a 3% tax increase. So that's our revenue from uh, property taxes. And keep in mind, I didn't include solid waste in here because it's kind of noise because it would take care of itself. So this is just what we need to balance as a budget. So then we're estimating that that's what our new growth will be in blue. And then um, I looked at all the fees and remittances and uh, tax transmittals from the state and built in a 1.5% to 2% uh, variable growth to say, okay, we know for this year we're going to get a little bit more. So that's that non-tax revenue. The purple is directly linked to capital items that we know we're going to have. So basically what I've done is I've said, okay, for every capital item, that's getting paid for by fund balance. So then that gives us our total resources to work with. About $82.2 million is what we're starting with. So then if we come down to the outputs, we are right now paying about $2.5 million every two weeks for payroll. So if I back out solid waste, that's about $61 million annually for our current payroll with the wage study at our current levels. If we add in our B budget currently, and I took out our solid waste again and our EMS because they're kind of off by themselves, that gives us beginning expenses of 80.9 million, giving us working capital of what's left of about $3.7 million. So remember, this is if we're able to take new growth and 3% like we so then we come down to our known increases. Right now, our current annual medical cost to the county is $10.8 million. 
if we build in what we have traditionally seen as a trend of 7%, our increase, and this is if our friends at Alliant can manage costs, continue to manage costs, we're looking at about a $754,000 increase to medical insurance. We are looking at um, a Medicaid expansion being pushed down to the counties. There's about $8 million that the state needs to come up with. It's going to get pushed down to the counties. I'm hearing numbers anywhere from half a million to a million dollars for Kootenai County's share. I'm being optimistic here and putting in $750,000 for our share. Um, wage study finish, dartboard amount, about a quarter of a million dollars to make people whole, to fix things, to correct errors. And then we get down to COLA and our uh, merit slash step moves slash matrix increases, all of those increases besides the COLA. Those are those, those two figures down there. I just did a general peanut butter estimate based on that big $60.9 million number up above just to give us a target. So that, those total costs, 5.5 million. Michelle, can you roll up for me just to touch? Pitch, okay. So then capital. So we've talked about moving forward on the new building. I heard numbers about architect fees, maybe half a million for architect fees. Okay, so I plug those in. And then again, the purple ones I've just plugged into fund balance. Um, software upgrades for community development. We talked about this last year at the budget and the board assured community development that that software would be part of the budget. So we put that in there. And then of course, uh, year two of our vehicle lease, because our capital starts as a zero-based budget, we got to add that back in. So right now, we're looking at the beginning capital uh, fund balance use for uh, capital things at 1.4 million. That leaves us a deficit of about 3.2 million. So what I did was I went and looked at open positions and said, okay, if they've been open for 80 or more days, what does that get us? Well, that gets us down to about 1.7 million. And that's kind of where we are. And this is the rosiest picture at a very high level. This is our rosiest picture of what we're looking at right now. now I want to talk about this number up here, this 400,000. It's a very small number compared to this. What that 400,000 does is it applies the consumer price index to our B budget, which we slashed last year. What that does is a few things. Number one, it takes into account any contract increases, because we usually have contract increases year over year. And the groups have to go through and do a bunch of paperwork to calculate all of those contract increases. So besides that and just the cost of doing business going up, this number in comparison to the entire budget is pretty small of an increase. And what it's going to do is it's going to save the groups a ton of time, because we're going to if you guys are okay with it, we're going to kick off the budget and we're going to build that 2% index into the B budget. And we're going to say, okay, here you go. You can move it wherever you want to. You don't have to fill out any forms. We're just indexing your operations budget and you're done. Now, if you want to take some money from your B budget and put it somewhere else, well, that's something you can negotiate with the commissioners. Or if you want to buy a piece of equipment and there's not a whole lot of capital money, from your B budget. You could freeze a position, but we're looking pretty tight down here as a best case scenario. Now, before we get too far, I'm going to have Michelle scooch over to the right and up to the top again, and we're going to look at the Debbie Downer view, but don't get too depressed. But this is just a reality check for us because this is the worst case. If the state comes back and says, sorry, you can't tax anymore. You get 0% tax increase. That's what you get. That's what we took this year. And you get no new growth, zero. Big egg. And I left the fees the same. And I left the fund balance use the same, just for general. Then if we scroll up a little bit, personnel's the same. The budget's the same. Now we have a little less to work with here, a little bit less to work with. 
So I'm still leaving medical insurance at 7%. Maybe we decrease that, pass some on to the employees in order to help balance our budget. I left that 2% growth in there again because it is so immaterial compared to our $100 million budget. It's pretty small and it probably saves that amount of man hours to put that in there. I put the Medicaid expansion at a million and then I just cut everything else just because, I mean, we're going to have to tighten our belts big time if we don't have these revenue sources. And then the rest is pretty much the same. So again, I, I froze some positions. We're down to about a million. So this is doable if we don't have a whole bunch of requests. So what we're doing as far as process goes is, is we're saying, OK, let's, let's reduce the amount of paperwork. No more workbooks. We'll give you a form for personnel. We'll give you a form for capital. We'll give you a form for B budget. And baked into that form is going to be cost-benefit analysis, which we can help you with, so that you can really think about what you're asking for and set you up for success. So when you come before the board to ask for this item, all that information is going to be there in a real succinct form. The other cool part about the form is, once you fill it out, you press a button on the form, thanks to Michelle and her uh, te technological prowess, and our group, our innovation group, tested all these forms last week. So you press a button, it goes directly to us. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to touch the system. You don't have to attach anything. You don't have to do anything. It all comes to us. We look at it. We review it. We check it. We put it in your budget. Done. Just like that. So we're hoping that you can do what you do every day, your day job, and we can do the bulk of the budget work. And you'll have more time to analyze and think about your operation and think about the future of your operation. And we're here to help you with that. So can we flip back to the agenda? So this is the, the fun part of it all, is now we get to play with sticky notes. So I'm going to come over here. Now, does everybody have sticky notes and Sharpies? Excellent. Okay. So we'll do a, a, a quick retouch of this. So our, uh, our, our chairman already talked about the threats of our revenue. And again, I talked about the threats of our revenue. Um, we have, we're close to a Superfund site that could affect us. Um, just economic uncertainty in general. Um, we're looking at higher crime rates, um, affordable housing is creating a problem, um, and our legislature in general. Um, these, are, these are threats to our stability financially. We do have opportunities that we are growing. People are moving here. And as long as we have the ability to tax, then we have a revenue source that's stable and it will move in the same direction as our growth. Um, and we have a great location. People really want to be here. So I'm going to take this one down because we kind of already beat that one up. And leave this one open. And then our strengths. We have a de dedicated workforce. We have people who are creative. We have people who are innovative. We have people who are working very hard to do their jobs the best way they can to save resources. We've seen that across the board. And we saw that last year in a big way when we did the wage study. Everybody worked hard. Everybody dug deep to get that to the finish line. So we have it within us to do this. Um, we have a really good juvenile service. We have a really good uh, uh, justice service. And we are fiscally conservative in this area. So. We're already known for, you know, pinching pennies anyway. Um, but again, that double-edged sword, we are growing. We have expenses. We have space needs. I mean, we all know how crammed we are into our spaces. We have those space needs, and those are expensive. Um, we also still have wage competition. We still have things to fix with the wage study. But we're doing better on that. So I'm going to take this down, too.
So in our earlier meeting when we just started talking about this, I put up a priority panel for the commissioners so as they thought of things to put up here that they could add. So priorities for 2021, I'm just going to read off what was put up here by the commissioners. Are these yours, Leslie? Yeah, these are Leslie's. Mm -hmm. Okay. So finish the pay plan. Uh, prosecutor compression on wages, okay. A third to a half of an FTE. Um, parks. parks and snow groomers. And, snow groomers. and community development software, okay. So things to not bring forward, Leslie has. No capital requests outside of restricted funds and no new programs unless they eliminate personnel. So that's what we have so far. So are there some priorities that you would like to add to this panel? Wait, study. Okay. I, I would second basically what Leslie has up there, completion of, of the uh, wage. Here, here, I'll give you this. Do you want my blue? Yeah, uh, no foregone taxes. Okay. Period, period, end of subject. Okay. I'll put that up high. Others? Cola. Okay. Absolutely. Cola. All right. And with 16,000 veterans in the county, we need a second veteran service officer. Okay. So that's going to be a new personnel. All right. Anything off the table? something you don't even want brought forward. I think you hit on it. No increases to the B budget. No increases to the C budget freeze. Okay, but you're okay with the indexed? Well, yeah, we're going to I think we're going to have to do the indexing, but aside from the indexing, everything has to be frozen. Okay. In fact, last year we succeeded in what? We reduced our B budget by 3% and still took down the uh, mill rate. Was yeah. it from 27 to, or 28 to 24,000? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think this year we, you know, we keep, with the exception of COLA, we keep B and C flat. Okay. In fact, I'd say don't even bring it forward. If it, if it comes forward, I'm just going to say no. That's okay. it. I want to put the people first. And if we, and we did that last year, but we were able, because of the 3% tax increase, to make some other accommodations. We might not have that luxury. Grant, please. Well, that would just, it's, it's any new asks, because C, C budget basically. starts it's flat asks. every year. Right, it starts at zero. Right. So, okay. Starts at zero, yeah. Starts at zero. Yeah. Yeah, well, for example, yeah, with the vehicles, based. we're already, we're contractually bound, so we know we're going to make that payment, but, but right. yeah, it's new ask. Thank you. Okay. Leslie, do you, uh, do you have any views on the C budget or any items to not bring forward? Okay. Okay. All right, so no COLA, but wage study. Anything else? Are there any priorities that you have do you have a vision of what you want 2021 to do besides wages? Are there any, is there anything else in there that you want to focus on? I think pending the outcome of what the legislature decides, um, I think we need to consider proceeding with the architectural okay. for the new building. But then again, we're talking about fund balance here. Are you okay with that? Well, mm -hmm. We'll see what happened, what the legislature does. I mean, that's, if they, if they don't do anything, sure. Uh, but I, I think it says on, on the bottom there, do not bring forward uh, foregone taxes. Oh, 
Oh, oh you meant it for down there. Yep. I, want, I want that down there. Okay. And it Let's seems to that. me, it seems to me that if we complete the weight study without COLA, we just start sliding backwards again. That doesn't make any sense to me. The, peop the people are what makes, the people who work here are what makes the county work. See, the thing that we have to bear in mind is when we discuss priorities, consciously or subconsciously, we're making assumptions. So if the assumption is worst case, then you address this in one manner. If the assumption is best case, then you address it in another. So are we assuming worst case, that is to say that, let's say hypothetically we're frozen? I, I'm assuming worst case. Worst case? I'm assuming worst case, because you can always add back in. Precisely. It's so much harder to cut. So that, that's just where my mind goes. Okay. Right. And that, that well, saves you time balancing well, the budget. I, you know, I think people ought to take a look at their last year's budget and realize that this is a year is going to be a lot harder than last year because we made some major adjustments last year. And going down these bunny holes about best case, worst case, you don't know. Who knows what the legislature is going to do? Nobody knows. And we could spend a lot of time spinning wheels here talking about best case, worst case. I think that we all should have a, a philosophy of this is going to be a lean and mean year. And so when you submit your de department budgets, last year, what, what was the initial ask? 19 million over the year before. 19 million of a maybe $100 million budget. That's stupid. That's dumb. We can't do that. And, and we're not, I, I for one, I'm not going to be sorting through going, I'm just going to go, no, no, no. So don't do that. Let's not play that game. That's a game that's been played here year after year after year after year. Ask for a lot, get a little. No. Leslie, any thoughts? Uh, well, I, I just have to agree as far as um, coming in flat, you know, with that 2%. It may come... You know, 400,000 is not a lot, but if worst case scenario comes and we have to cut that, you know, I, I just want to take a good look at everything. Are there things that are maybe outdated, antiquated that you're still budgeting for that you're not using? Um, just taking a, a deeper dive and we really, I, I believe that this board is really wanting to focus on people. So if the B budget can help us focus on people, then I, I think that's a good way to go. Um, I do like the two percent because of the contracts and and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm willing to just keep that on the table. But especially capital asks or um, new programs. I mean, you have to show the return on investment. You have to show where that money is going to come from, where the money is going to be saved down the line. And um, if you really feel like you cannot live without another person, bring it forward. We have to look at it. But just so you know, I mean, we're, we're trying to take care of as much as we can. And it's just, I, I put up there the um, one third to half time full time employee for parks and waterways and snow groomers. That may not be a budget increase at all. So we're just, we're not there yet. That's right. And uh, that could be out of restricted funds. So, you know, if you have something like that, do that. But, you know, I know that there's a couple departments that they don't have a choice. I mean, their clients are who their clients are. And so addressing that, you know, we got to keep in with state statute and have to make sure that um, certain departments that open us up to lawsuits are, are focused on. So we also have uh, things like planning and zoning that people deal with the county every single day and we are f falling further and further behind because we're, not, we're losing people because our wages are not competitive. People quit here on Friday and go to work on Monday for 20% more money. That's not acceptable. We can't do that. That's what the market is, whether we like it or we don't. So to say to planning and zoning, don't you dare ask for salary increases or more people is unrealistic. You will hear about it when we start getting backlogged down there in terms of building permits and things. Those are the services we provide. Those are what people insist on, is good, efficient, you know. And community development's also fee-based. So a lot of times, like motor vehicle licensing, the fees for the extra person end up paying. So. 
Yeah, that's, I'm glad you brought that up because interestingly enough, when we went through the most recent wage study, the overall average was about, um, that is to say, the average for a county employee was approximately 8% underpaid versus the, uh, the public sector market in question. And over the several years that the studies were done, they tended to show underpayment of anywhere from 8 to 17%. The 8%, I guess we've been catching up, slowly but catching up. And to the point that uh, both Leslie and Bill raised, especially with regard, for example, to community development, uh, we had one case, uh, I think one study or one indicator came back showing one of the planners at 40% underpaid. Now, clearly, we, could not, we couldn't do a 40% increase. We couldn't even come close. But the fact of the matter is David faces this every day. And so when we look at, or at least speaking for myself, his budget, he's got $200,000 in there for software. So the question is going to arise for me, does that software ease the load on his personnel such that we don't have to be as quick to add personnel? If it doesn't, then maybe that's something that we need to reconsider so he does get the money for the added people. But he's, his folks are dealing with people every day. Uh, the relationship is one that's relatively intense because they're basically working a process. It's a project when they sit with a developer who's planning a subdivision. And, you know, we lose people. We lost a couple of years ago, we lost someone to, and I brought this up before, perhaps not in this body, to, uh, I think it was Spokane Valley, for $11,000 more. We lost one to the city of Rathdrum for $8,000 more. Uh, and this is ongoing. So these are the considerations that we have to make. And it's on a case by case and a department level basis. As far as department level, <coughs> pardon me, uh, one of the things that I believe that I know my other commissioners don't fully agree with is we've got a real disparity between our patrol deputies and our detention deputies. And we need to at least look at that and have that conversation in depth, not just go, oh, they're jail guards. They are and they're not. If you stand up two deputies side by side, a patrol deputy and a detention deputy, they look exactly alike. If you look at what they need to do to get hired on, exactly alike. Yet there's a pretty big disparity in their pay. Now some. Some jurisdictions handle that by, as they say, everybody starts out in jail and you move up to patrol as you can. That's one, one way to do that. But it needs to be looked at. The conversation needs to be had. That's all. That's all I can promise. Okay. The other thing I would bring up, um, and I don't, you took weaknesses off, but uh, this is a real thorn in my side, is the cigarette tax. The legislature seems to be obsessed with high tax, with taxation. The argument that I think one or more of the legislators are making is that the people of Idaho are overtaxed. Well, if you look at where we, from a property tax perspective, where we rank nationally, we're in the bottom half. We're certainly not the lowest, but we're in the bottom half. And what I find interesting is the approach they're taking toward our budgets but at the same time, I don't see the resolve to raise the cigarette tax. The cigarette tax in Idaho is 57 cents per pack. The national average is about $1.87. There are only an, a small handful of states, four or five, I believe, that are lower than we are. I don't see that here. Maybe that's a weakness. And I, and I press this point with legislators, and if you get the opportunity, do it. Because to me, these people are injuring themselves and potentially injuring others as well. But anyway. By the way, that would add $57 million in the first year to state coffers if, if we just went to the average of $1.87. It would probably diminish over time because people, I suspect, would quit smoking, but at least it would help us out in the first couple of years. Do you think that it would be strategic to also keep it under Washington's as a lot of people come across the border? What is one? Are they over It's two? pretty high. It's, yeah. it's really high. That's the thing. Washington's property tax is so much higher than ours that if you add our, our income tax and our property tax together, we're still lower than Washington. Right. So it's, it's an interesting statistic. And because we're on a border, we have some unique revenue Good sorts point. of things, too. So since we're here and since we've gone through most of this, before I show you the timeline and our process walkthrough, I'm just going to hit this board really fast and then we can move on. So 
I'm hearing that we will entertain some personnel, but we have to, you know, Just justify it. Okay. Um, do we want groups to factor in promotions and succession planning if they know somebody's going to retire? Or if somebody is getting some kind of um, certification that they're going to get a raise? Do we need to factor that into the budget? I would say yes. I think you have to, but to what extent? There are degrees. And then this one, are you open to me looking at the sick leave termination pool? Because last year we had people retiring and, and it was not adequate to cover our retirements. So is that an analysis you would like to do? Yes, done? Okay. definitely. So we covered new positions. We covered, okay, so at this time, do we want the COLA left in? Your thoughts? Well, once again, I'm just going with worst case scenario. So I, I rather focus on finishing the wage plan and then, you know, tackling COLA next year. Now, if we end up, you know, where the legislature doesn't do anything, then we can add it, we can add add it. it in. I disagree. I think COLA it's just like, uh, and I would base it on the Social Security COLA. What was that this year, do you know? It was about 2%. About what? About 2%, I think. Okay, well, whatever it was, I'd, I'd tie it to something like that. But every year that you don't do COLA, you fall behind. And we have come too far, and painfully too far, doing the wage study to start sliding backwards, whether it's one year, two years, or three years. If not, if not one year, let's wait two years. We'll save some more money. And that's been money saved on the backs of the employees. So you're, are you saying that if you had to choose one or the other, you would choose COLA? Over are what? A uh, wage study? No. Are you saying? It's not a one or the other. You want to consider both? The people are the strength of the organization, and you can't shortchange them. Well, I mean, there's, you know, there's no harm in considering both. If we have to make the sacrifices, we make them as we go. Well, it's we can bake simple. it in. So we can bake in a 2% bake in COLA, and we can bake in the fixes to the wage study at this point in time. Now, we've talked about doing steps for the wage, for the general pay plan, as well as the doing matrix. What? I didn't hear. We steps. talked about doing steps, steps okay. for the general pay plan. Okay. So is that something that you want to have factored in, or do you want to just talk merit or bonus pool at this time? Well, it sounds even in the best case scenario, we're still a million dollars short. And my understanding is the steps are going to be one point something million. So I don't think we can entertain it this year. Okay. So when you talk steps, just so that we're all on the same page, Dina, you're referring to steps, something analogous to what the sheriff has? Yeah. So that would be a, a moving up up the steps. We base the wage study on time and position. Now a year has gone by. Is everybody stepping up a year? Or are we going to just look at COLA and apply a COLA at this time? Or do we want to do a bonus pool? And I have all these things up here. So I can factor all of them in at this time, and you can decide to cut them later. But if there's something today that you feel like, eh, probably don't even want to look at it, and that saves you having to balance that out of the budget deficit. Until we know what the legislature is going to do, I feel uncomfortable including or excluding anything. Okay. We don't know. Yeah, but again, if, if we're proceeding with a worst case scenario, I would have to agree with Leslie here. Leave it out. Okay. Leave the steps out. Okay. But that is what you said. So general pay plan steps would be out. Bonus pool. Would you do a bonus pool instead? Instead of? Steps. See, given the choice of steps or bonus pool, I'd much rather see a, a step. Okay. Yeah, I think that's much more uh, objective okay. and not subjective, and it's much less prone to uh, abuse. Okay. So what I have here is for the general pay plan, because I'm, I'm assuming that the, the matrix steps will be funded. I mean, if we're talking about general pay plan and we're talking about COLA, so we're talking about two types of increases potentially, right. throwing bonus into the mix as well right now I think is going to be a problem. Okay. Again, if the legislature doesn't act in the worst case, we can deal with it. 
Okay, we can so we'll put that on the back burner yeah, what do and you leave think? the cola up. Okay, great. Saving time, saving money, right? Okay, so matrix steps are in, general pay plan st uh, fixes are in, COLA is in, new positions. Overtime. So normally, when we raise overtime in the prior year, we put that into the budget, but unless we reset the overtime at that new higher rate, it rolls back to the prior year overtime rate. So do you want to roll back to the prior year overtime rate or do you want to maintain overtime that was granted last year as a baseline? Say that again. Okay. So when we start out the budget, we have overtime pools in each one right, of the right. departments, right? Which is based on? Which is based on whatever their overtime pool was. Was. So, okay. So we had some groups come forward last year and had their overtime increase to a new level. Mm -hmm. So that new level is the new starting point unless you want to roll it back to the prior year. Roll it back. Okay. That's what I would do, yeah. Roll okay. it back. So roll back. Again, you know, again, I'm operating under the assumption of a worse case. Okay. Well, I, I have a, a kind of a broader question here. Um, if I were doing this, I would have on one side of the, the whiteboard, the worst case, ins, outs, ins, outs, ins, outs. Over here, the best case, ins, outs, ins, outs. And then when the legislature decides what the heck they're going to do, we go, oh, it's this one. Okay. But we don't have that now. No. But what I can do is I can go back. Yeah, and you can, can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Can, and that's a good, that's a good do idea. do that, and that's then so I can so send it out to the people can see what group. we're talking about. Yeah, we can do that. For right now, though, just... In general, things that absolutely you're for, absolutely you're against. That at least winnows it down for us because we can only initiate the budget once at one level and then add or subtract. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So, on call, holiday buyback, are any of those kinds of things, do you want to see those brought forward or do you want to hold off on those? The people who are currently have on call in their budget, I would like them to go back and examine the uh, new policy that was passed and make sure that your um, on-call pay fits into that policy. And that's kind of where I'd like to start. Would you want more on-call hours allocated or do you just want to leave it where it is? Uh, I'd like to leave it or cut it. If, okay. if people are you know, having on-call pay and it's outside the policy, then, then I'd like to see that cut. Raise the on-call levels? No, keep not it the no, same. No, raise no. Okay. What about holiday buyback? Do you want to leave those levels as what, is? What or is do that? You raise what is that costing us? Um, under sheriff? What Any sheriff idea? Where's the? <laughs> I see you. <laughs> I know it's over a hundred thousand. Over what? It's over a hundred. Over a hundred. Okay. I'd leave it alone for now. Okay, so we'll leave it as is. Terrific. Okay. So we're going to look at these. We're okay with an index increase at 2%. I'm, I'm going to change that. All right. That's your COLA. Uh, this is for the B budget. Go ahead. So we would do a 2% index increase to make up for contracts or any other mm -hmm. cost of business mm -hmm. increases right off the bat. Okay. Community development software, do we all agree? Community development software, you want that in the budget, okay. We know we need to do the cars. Right. Um, sounds like we're all supporting the architect at half a million. So there are some other things that we usually fund with fund balance, and I think that's kind of what Grant was hinting at. We usually set aside money for IT's five-year plan, uh, for maintenance's five-year plan, and then any anything that you want to allocate towards the new building, other capital things like vehicles and other software upgrades, those are kind of your big capital asks. Mm -hmm. So are there any things here that you, in these flavors that you don't want brought forward or things that you would expect to be brought forward? Or do you want us to just kind of leave these open so that the groups come forward and ask for these things or Given our limited resources, are there some things that you'd just rather not? I, I think I heard 
and lastly, vehicles are fine as long as they're restricted funds. Um, so is there any, any of those flavors you have any commentary on? I just want to say something about the vehicles. We do have a good fleet management team. If you need a vehicle, please put in with them, unless you have restricted funds, and then that's fine. But if you find out that, you know, hey, in the next budget year, we really should replace this and that vehicle, get on the fleet management list, because we may not need to buy new. We may have a trickle down, uh, since we're going to have, you know, about 30 something patrol cars online, hopefully by summer. We will put one of those uh, fleet management forms out with yeah, the budget thing? forms. So if you have a need for a vehicle, you can just go ahead and, and fill that form out and we'll get going on that. Mm. So then all these I other kind of miscellaneous things. So do we want to bake in what our general average is for medical insurance increase? Yeah, just that's probably in there. good, yes. Okay. Um, are, are we going to entertain an employee contribution component to that? Is that something that we should it? tell? Should we tell Alliant? Because we're going to go out to Alliant. We're going to say, okay, start cooking up our budget for this year. Do you want an employee increase component in, in their calculations? And aren't there other ways to do that? You can do go a sole, sole source. So you don't have to say, hey, we're giving you 2% on the COLA, and we're taking it back on your medical. Why? No, but we could say, sorry, you've got to go to Kootenai or whatever. Okay, so you would want to so explore other cost-saving measures. There are, yeah, I'm, and, I, and I would agree with that. I don't want to impose any increase. Okay, mm -hmm. all right, it's off. Did you want to weigh in? That's fine. Okay. All right, so there could be some other increases. We will bring those forward, but just things to think about. Uh, stop loss. Depending on our claims, our stop loss insurance premiums could go up. Explain explain that so, so me and everybody understands. Okay. <laughs> so we know we're self-insured, right? Okay. So when you're self-insured, you pay your own claims. You, you create this pool of money, which is our Fund 14 health account. What it does is it keep our, keeps our costs down. So basically the county pays for all of the claims. But if the claims go way beyond what we're prepared to do, and it would decimate our entire system, we pay for this extra insurance called stop loss. So once it gets to a certain level, then insurance company takes over. So we're not completely decimated in our funds. So depending upon the level of claims we have and how much we use this stop loss, depends on you know what our premiums are gonna be every year. If we're using it a lot, then they're gonna want more Mm -hmm. money each year so mm -hmm. we'll know more about that but that's something to keep in mind because it could vary a little it could vary a lot depending upon what we get another thing to think about is a high deductible health plan we may get to critical mass where our Blue Cross Blue Shield is just too expensive I know a lot of industry companies go to a high deductible health plan where your premiums go way down and you have a health savings account and you put money into that health savings account instead of, say, paying your premiums, and then you pay out of that health savings account, it's tax advantage, and that money rolls forward every year, kind of like your FSA, but it never goes away. You can earn interest on it, but you're, you're, if you're a healthy person, your medical costs go way down. If you have a catastrophic incident and you have to be hospitalized, it pays. After a certain deductible, it pays it all. I personally had a really, really bad motorcycle crash, and I was out of commission for about six months, and I had a high deductible health plan, and it covered pretty much everything. Once I had that money saved in my health savings account, and it covered what my deductible was, and that insurance covered everything else. But the idea is, is that you, instead of giving it to an insurance company, you put it in your own health savings account for when you need it, try to keep yourself healthy, but your premiums go way down. So a lot of companies do that as a benefit. They'll change to that kind of a benefit plan. So that's something that the county has talked about doing. It's something that we could look at again. Over time, as people go onto that plan, they're pretty happy with it because they're more in control of their money. Philosophically speaking, I'm for a plan that uh, doesn't increase premiums any more than we have to, 
But if you're the kind of family or person that goes to the ER every time you have his sniffles, it's going to cost you plenty. If you go when you really need it, broken finger or something or whatever, you're going to be in pretty good shape. But I, the people, I was a hospital administrator, and we saw a direct correlation when people had everything's covered, they'd go there for every little itch and scratch. And, and we all need, as a, as a team, to be cognizant if we're not going to hurt each other not to do that. And if the people who do that are going to have to pay for it in, in much higher deductibles for those little things. And that's just a philosophical. Okay. The, the thing about high deductible is control. You have control over your resources. My health savings account came with me. I cannot use it for certain things, but I can pull on those funds that I put away years ago. I can still use those for health care expenses. So it's an option for us to look at when our premiums get to that point where it makes way more sense to take a smaller portion of your paycheck to keep that medical insurance, that basic medical insurance, and build up that savings account. So we'll look into that more closely. I think we're kind of heading that direction eventually. I don't think we've met that critical mass yet, but I think we will in a few years, if not sooner than that. So Medicaid expansion, I got a couple numbers up here. Do we want to bake in half a million, 750, a million? What do we want to bake in just for starters? So the question that I have is, what is county assistance costing us today? How would you compare one with the other? County assistance is self-funded. Meaning what? Meaning that we haven't taxed for county assistance for years. It pays for itself. Through the indigent, indigent fund, indigent fund, fund 40. 40. So the assumption is that with Medicaid expansion, that goes away? Um, there's talk that there's a possibility that they would allow our county to tax that fund, um, but I don't know the details. But if that is the possibility, then we would fund that through the fund balance as well. OK. I say put in the middle number and let's just wait. Okay. Yeah. Don't bake it, though. OK. OK. All right, we'll just, we'll, we'll put it on preheat. Okay. okay, yeah, that that makes sense, okay. And then another thing to think about, I'm not sure um, HR might be able to answer this, but our iCrimp rate, do we see an increase in iCrimp rate every year, pretty regularly? Okay, so when we bake that 2% in, we're gonna be fine. Now, for, for people who don't know, and there are some, what's iCrimp? I crimp, and if you went to the trainings uh, recently, I crimp is our insurance company for the county for risk management. Mm -hmm. So um, that's something that we, we we have it on all of our vehicles. We have it, for, you know, for accident insurance, fire, flood, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yes, yes, and our lawsuits. Our Thank you. Yeah, lawsuits, that kind of stuff. Thank you. So, yep. so that I think. I think that's pretty much it. I think we've arrived at um, Time major line. decisions. So um, analysis and support preferences. So this is just a real quick one, and you can think about this, and I can get back to you via email. But think about the kind of support materials you want, the kind of analysis that you want. Do you want paper binders? Do you want electronic information? What kinds of Numbers do you want to see? What kinds of analysis do you want to see? We want to tailor make that. And it can be different for each of you, but we'll, we'll ask for your feedback offline on the kinds of things you want to see to help support your decision making because this is huge. This is a huge burden on these guys. So we want to be able to support you the best way for your decision making uh, preferences. So. With that, I'm going to have Michelle kick over to the blue tab here. This is our project timeline. So this is the budget in one glance. So we're right here. So the next one, you're going to get an email with a link to all the forms and instructions. In between here, we're going to have some training sessions. Because we have new forms, we'll do several sessions where we're going to show you how to use the forms, what the process is going to be, which buttons to push, answer your questions so that when this happens, when this day comes, you're ready. 
On April 13th, statutorily, that's when we're asking that you have all your stuff done. So in between here, you'll want to be talking to your managers, your elected officials, and letting them know what your priorities are so that they can say yes, no, and advance your budget out so it's ready to be presented to the board. So we take a couple of weeks to compile everything, clean it up, do some trends, kick off our position budgeting so you can see what your people costs are, and then we're going to start our meetings between the BOCC and the elected officials. So when you met with your elected officials, they can represent your asks in those meetings, and we will work directly with each elected official to help them put their presentations together. So for about three weeks, we'll do that, and then deliberations begin. So then the BOCC has the fun task of saying yes, no, yes, no, until we're balanced. When we're balanced, end of July, we're thinking that before BOE, we can get balanced. If we can balance on the 10th of July, we can have everything ready and raring to go on July 31st. We're going to present you that preliminary balance budget. Then we're going to, with your approval, we're going to notice it in the paper twice, and then we're going to come in and do a budget hearing, and we're going to be off and running into 2021. So this is it in a nutshell. And all the details will be tied to this in a calendar document that I'm going to send out to you so you have a visual of these time periods of the, the kinds of work you're going to be doing in those time periods. I've got them all highlighted. So it'll be easy to follow, and there won't be any surprises as to deadline. Uh, Dean, I have a question. Sure. Um, April 13th, is it, is, isn't that aggressive? Uh, no, that's our statutory deadline. I thought the statutory deadline was uh, first Monday in May. Well, that's when we're going to start our uh, meetings. But April 13th is when we need everything back so that we can compile all that information for you. We need two weeks to get all that information together. Okay. So we ask that the groups have all of their information back to us, and they'll be back and forth, and they'll be saying, oh, we need to add this or subtract this. But we want to make sure that by the beginning of May that everything's in. We want to make sure that everything's in. So we need that time period to put things together for you. So you're saying between the 13th? And the first, and the first uh, week yes. in May. All right. Yes, but we're hoping, and gold stars for anybody who wants to get done early, we're thinking, since we're sending this out to you so much earlier, the first week of April, you should be done. I mean, we're, we're reducing the amount of work that you need to do and the amount of touch that you need to do in the system. So April 13th, you'll be done way before that, we're hoping. But you have until April 13th. If you need to take that much time, go for it. But we're just thinking that you probably won't need that amount of time. So you can get in, you can get out, and, and get on with your lives. So this, in a nutshell, is our, our process. You have this with you. Uh, basically, this is the first part where you're doing all the work. Auditor takes over. After you get all your stuff baked in, you've talked to your elected official. We've reviewed your forms. We've worked back and forth with you to clarify and make sure that we have things represented in the system that w the way you want to do it. You review it with your elected official, and you advance it to the next level. We take over from there. We're going to consolidate and compile everything, and we're going to sit down with each elected official, and we're going to help put together presentations for them or organize their information how they want to present it to the BOCC. And after we do that, each elected will come before the BOCC and do their presentation on their asks. We'll make changes during those meetings per the board's direction. And then after that, they're going to start deliberating. Let me scroll up. And then from there, these are the action steps. So in the middle of BOE, there will also be deliberations. We'll try to make it as easy as possible. And then from the 11th to the 30th, we're going to prepare all the budget documents for you, and we're going to come before you on the last day of July with a balanced budget. We'll do our public hearing approximately a month later, and then we'll adopt the day after Labor Day. Mm -hmm. So that 
is our budget. And it's hard to believe it's already here. So questions? Anything else we should bake in? Any thoughts, ideas? Less questions. Yeah. Nice job. Thanks. Sorry about I the technical difficulties. I think it's a good start. So that takes us to public comment. Time to speak up. Thoughts, <laughs> concerns, anything. I'll make one comment. Uh, yeah, go ahead. The way I would approach the talk today about worst case and best case scenarios is speak up so people can hear. Do you want to use this? Yeah, you can use a mic here. Okay. <clears throat> As it relates to the thought process that you'll take for the budget, I don't think it's appropriate to try to attempt to bake in a worst case or best case in budgeting. What you should be doing, I believe, is what is expected. And then if there's a shortfall, that is what fund balance is supposed to do. So by complicating it by Trying to anticipate what the legislator is going to do is, I think, a losing proposition. If you look at the timeline, you'll see that we'll have a decision likely by the legislature probably sometime in March. Mm -hmm. So it won't be too late to change direction at that point in time, but true. budget should be based on expectations, not worst or best case scenario. Okay. Good point. I'll just piggyback on that and say that in my experience, you usually can find an ear to the ground at the state house that'll give you an idea of the likelihood of worst and best. I've never known a legislature that you couldn't predict to some extent based on ears to the ground. Anybody else? Sure. There was a question over here. One of the things that Commissioner Brooks said, we have been fighting for years. When you present a budget, please present a reasonable budget. It takes a lot of time on our end and on their end to sort through this. And budgets are based on need and what we're expected to do for this community. Uh, a lot of what uh, has been talked about today, uh, to echo uh, Clark Brandon's comment, is accountability throughout the process, and I'll, I'll, just, I'll second that. You know, we really need to be accountable, sharp our pencils, and things like that. And I'm going to pick on the high deductible health plan that Dino was talking about. I thought it was a good idea when we looked at it before. I'd love to see us look at it again. The idea of bringing PTO in just in conjunction to help supplement it, bringing a VIVA forward, something that we can use and carry with us even after we leave the county part ways. Um, I really think. Even though it's kind of small potatoes compared to some of these other numbers, it does add up every year. We look at all these numbers, we're talking about 2% to 3% for people's wages for what the legislature is going to let us do, and then we look at medical and it's 7%. It's ridiculous. And so I, I'd love to see um, time put into looking into that again. Okay. Anybody else? Anyone else? Nobody? Speak up. Yep, absolutely. You guys do a little bunch of work for us, too. Oh, here's Nick. Mr. Nick. You know, one of the things we never talk about are those fee-based fee -based activities. Yeah. Um, and looking at our fees. Um, Carson always looks at fees every five years. We're going to look at that. And making sure that our fees are commensurate with, with cost and those changes. I also want to echo uh, what our treasurer said. I think... It's always good to base your budget on the expectation and the reality of doing business. It doesn't mean it's going to be funded, um, but uh, I think um, presenting a budget that represents what you really need to run your operations is, is the best is the best approach. Anybody else? And then I will hand it back to DOCC. Okay. So I've heard three people say base it on expectations. I can't disagree. Were the expectations realistic last year when the asks came in at 19 million over? They weren't. Speaking about revenue expectations. 
revenue expectation. And, and actually, we did that last year. And you're right. I, I would agree with you. We have to be, yes, thank you for that. Absolutely. Appreciate that. I don't know that I have anything to add. Leslie? I just, no matter what the legislature does, I'd love to come in with a 0%. That, that would just be a, a great goal to go for. Y'all are doing a great job this year so far, and uh, I don't know what the rest of the year would hold, but if you've done it so far this year, I think you can probably get it done next year as well. Uh, obviously, there's some you know things that are about to be catastrophic um, with community development software is one of them, but if there's not anything catastrophic in the future, then I would say please ask for what you need to do your job and to serve the public and not what you would like to do, what you would like to have, if that makes sense. Because my, my goal is to get that wage study done. My goal is to address compression and some of the other issues that have come up. And I, I can't do it if I have a lot of noise saying that, you know, we need this whammy jammy whatever. Um, so that's just where I'm coming from. Bill? Uh, I, my big thing is, when I came on last year and found we had $19 million in ask that we had to pare down to, it was horrible. And there are some things that the department heads know, uh, a lot of things that I don't know and that we don't know. And we, are, we count on you as part of the team to, uh, to pare that baby down as far as you can go because that's what we're about. Uh, you know, the, the relationship of income to services. This is a service organization and you're, you're, we are all the public servants, elected officials and, and just regular people. I mean, so don't, I mean, do yourself a favor and do the people of the county a favor and do the employees of the, uh, of the county a favor by not asking for things you don't need. Uh, there's a couple department heads in here and others that, uh, I couldn't believe the things they were asking for. And there are others who came in and asked for what they needed. And you know, they got what they wanted pretty quick. So be part of the team. Be part of the team. And uh, bunny holes are not in, I, I don't like that. I know people that can, if there's one to go down or two or three or five, you can get yourself all tripped up by making projections that you don't know are gonna be right. We have to deal with what is, and we will know fairly soon what the legislature is doing, and we'll react to it. So thank you guys for doing what you do. Okay, so before we conclude, I guess I need to ask, does anyone have a problem, and I think it's only fair if you're gonna speak up, speak up now with the timeline that was offered by Dina. Sheriff. Dina, do you want to? We can work with the sheriff's office. Well, I think that's countywide. I mean, it, it requires everybody submitting a budget to have those numbers, those actual numbers, <coughs> to the second Monday. That means through Sunday. Uh, I don't think we can have all that done in you know, one day. So if he needs. So do you want to take another look at that, Dina, and then get back with us? Okay, that'd be great. Appreciate it. Thank you, Sheriff. Point well taken. Sure. We don't have the ability to extract fees for a lot of different things. And it takes all of us to contact our legislators to encourage that. And let me give you an example from my world. We lost about $231,000 in driver's license last year because the fees are not commensurate with, with the actual cost of doing the business. Now, the, our driver's license services this last uh, calendar year went up about 13.5%. That's 13.5% more people come through the door than they did the year before. We're going to lose more money this year with those kind of numbers. 
but we don't have the statutory authority to attach an administrative fee that would be set by the board that would be, you know, let us at least break even. And, and I mean, the Constitution says we can't make a profit, but all we want to do is break even. And you know, the assessor has that ability with motor vehicles. We don't have that ability with driver's license. But we need each of you, you know, $231,000 is real money. I mean, that would pay for Dave's software. But if we can't recoup that cost, uh, we're just out. You know, we want to provide good service to the public. We, we want to reduce the lines. We want to do all those things. But, uh, you know, if we can't provide the service for, you know, for what it actually pays us, uh, we're not going to be able to do that. How many, how many employees do we have in the county? Approximate eight, huh? 839. Well, that's a lobbying group that can have a significant impact on legislators if we choose to do it. If we don't, then we lose money, as the sheriff's pointing out. So, so the word is get after the legislators. Do it as a group. Um, thank you for that. By the way, um, I'm going to uh, make copies of this. This is basically a synopsis of the bills that I mentioned to you earlier. Most of them on this sheet you might not care about, but I highlighted those three. I urge you, whichever way you're leaning, get in touch with your legislators. I did yesterday, and I didn't mince words. I thought some of this was crap, and I told them. I didn't use that word precisely, but um, I would have liked to. <laughs> we used another. Um, but anyway, really you should because I think they'll respond. You want to write, you want to call, uh, just go on and do a search under Idaho State, Le Idaho Legislature or Idaho Senate. Uh, these haven't gotten to the Senate yet, so do let them know how you feel. Um, and I'll make copies and we'll distribute them to you and you can forward to your people as you wish. Anything else? Okay. Yes, sir. I just want to remind the board that through URDs, the county is losing $3.2 million annually in the foreseeable future. So $3.2 million would pay for a lot of this stuff that we're looking at right now. Okay. Do you know if, it's, if the uh, legislature is scheduled to take another look at it? Probably not. This gets back to what we can do as a county from an advisory board standpoint in trying to stop the proliferation of URDs here in Goodman County. Okay. Anything else? Okay. The time is 1022, meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone.